Okay, welcome to the Data Science Competition Workshop, uh, Workshop 1, Applied Computer Vision. This workshop is presented to you by the NUS Statistics Society. Um, and uh, our presenters for today will be Georgie, Rama, Agatha, and Ita. So there will be a, another workshop by Up Level on day three, and uh, that will also be relevant to the competition. So who are we? Let me first introduce NUS Statistics Society to you. We are under the Department of Statistics and Applied Probability, and we are committed to foster a community of students passionate about statistics, data science and analytics, machine learning, and quantitative finance. But we are open to all students of any background, experience, and interests. Do stay connected with us and see what ways we can work together. Let me introduce you to our upcoming events. You can keep in touch with us in the following social channels. Our Statistics Society website is where you can find resources of all past workshops, slides, recordings, upcoming workshops for this semester, and etc. So that means that for semester one, you can receive all the resources as well. Our Telegram chat is where you can talk about all things under the sun, relevant topics, of course. Our Instagram is a place for broadcasting events, memes, statistical musings. Do check us out there. LinkedIn for serious content. And finally, our email if you'd like to co connect and collaborate with us. So what workshops do we have this semester? First, we have the Data Science Competition, Applied Computer Vision, which is today. We will be having a effective data storytelling workshop on Wednesday, 27 Jan at 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. We will also be having a using Tidyverse in R for data analysis and visualization. So this Tidyverse workshop would be on 4th of February, Thursday, uh, conducted by our Statistics Society members, Sanraj and Jianhui. To learn more about it, uh, check out the Statistics Society website here. So the DSC workshop by up level will be on day 3, 18 Jan, uh, from 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Uh, it will be an image task related workshop, and therefore it is an object detection and counting workshop. So that it is titled Using Computer Vision for Object Detection and Counting by Jackie Tan, co-founder and CEO for Up Level. Now, finally, welcome to our workshop. Introducing you to our workshops team, uh, I'm Jet, I'm the director of workshops. We have here Ming Liang, Peng, Michael Ng, and Michael Yang, who will be presenting the Effective Data Storytelling Workshop. Today, Rama, Agatha, Georgie and Ita will be presenting today's workshop on Applied Computer Vision. Rama and Georgie are studying computer science, Agatha is studying statistics, and Ita is studying data science and analytics. To learn more about workshops, uh, you can click the link here. Now, uh, welcome to the start of our workshop. Uh, before I hand over to Rama, the first presenter of today, uh, the slides can be found at this link over here. Uh, so let me send this on the YouTube. Uh, I can't send the link. Okay, take a short moment to uh, record down the link and you can follow through with the slides if you like. These slides are also available on the workshops website. So the workshop, uh, sorry, the, the Statistics Society website. So the Society website is the main one that you need to refer to, which is available here. If possible, someone can help to send this link on the YouTube chat. All right, let me now pass the time to Rama. We will bring you through today's workshop. Thank you, Jet. Hello, everyone. But in today's workshop, we will be teaching you all about computer vision and deep learning. I will first start out with an introduction to a traditional computer.
Thank you, Jed. Hello, everyone. In today's workshop, we will be teaching you all about computer vision and deep learning. I will first start out with an introduction to traditional computer vision and then go through some code that's used in computer vision. Agatha will talk about convolutional neural networks in deep learning, followed by Georgie, who will take us through transfer learning, which is a technique used in deep learning. And finally, Ethan will be sharing some useful tools and resources related to machine learning. So what is possible computer vision and deep learning? In the past, people always used traditional computer vision techniques that are more manual methods for extracting features from an image to specific image processing algorithms and methods. So when you first started on a computer vision task, you would go about it by detecting colors, edges, and objects. And as the resulting features would be human engineered, the reliability of the model depended directly on the methods that you chose to use for feature extraction. And then came along deep learning. Um, deep learning offered significant, uh, a significant increase in performance and accuracy gain for computer vision tasks. Um, and this is because deep, le deep learning models have millions of parameters that the computer generates for you in a neural network. Ever since then, traditional computer vision techniques have sometimes been thought of as relatively older or outdated, and also more laborious for humans. However, I'll be explaining to you why these classical computer vision methods still have a very important role today and why and when they can even be better than deep learning. So the first reason would be if deep learning is sometimes I as computer vision techniques can solve the problem much more efficiently than deep learning. Many computer things like color thresholding and pixel counting. Uh, you can switch. You can turn off the Google Meet because the audio is lagging. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, so uh, many computer vision algorithms like color thresholding and pixel counting are not class specific. So this means that they are very general and can perform the same for any image. And in contrast, features, features learned from a deep neural network are specific to your training data set that you use to train the neural network. And it may not perform well for images that are of a different kind from your training data set. So for example, we're classing two, classifying two objects as red or blue. A deep neural network given you give enough data to the model for it to learn. So maybe thousands of images of red images and blue images. However, it can be achieved through a simple color film with classical computer vision. So sometimes traditional computer vision offers a much simpler and much faster solution. The next reason would be transparency in computer vision algorithms versus a black box in deep learning. So if the data set you use to train your deep learning model is very limited, for example, the training data may not, be, may not be able to generalize and may perform poorly on new unseen data. Um, so it, it will not work well for the current task at hand. And it would be very difficult to manually tweak the parameters of the model because a deep neural network has millions of parameters with complex interrelationships. So in this way, deep learning models are considered a black box. But on the other hand, Traditional, compu traditional computer vision algorithms um, uh, can be tweaked by the engineer to perform better in case there are any problems that crop up. Uh, sorry about the audio. Is it, um, is it still lagging? Um, Okay, perhaps I can turn off my video so the audio can be clearer. Okay, I hope it's better now. So the ideal approach would be to use a hybrid of traditional computer vision and deep learning. So 
This is in high performance systems which need to be implemented quickly. So for example, you're building a security camera. Uh, okay, a computer vision algorithm can efficiently detect places or other features or moving objects in a scene. And then these detections can be passed into a deep neural network for object classification or identity verification, for example. So in this way, the neural network only needs to be applied on a small patch of the image, allowing us to save significant computing resources and training effort compared to if the entire image frame had to be processed by the neural network. I'll now be explaining some common steps that you would do in computer vision tasks and how to go about doing them in code. We'll be using the OpenCV library in Python, which is the library meant for computer vision tasks. So if you click the link here, it will bring you to a Google, to a folder where you can see a, a Python notebook. So you can right click and open it with Google Collaboratory. And for those who don't have Google Collaboratory, um, you can download the file into your computer, go to this website, which is a Google Collab website, click upload, upload your notebook there, and it will automatically open after you upload your notebook. So you would see something like this. So we first uh, start out by importing the libraries that we will be using. So CV2 um, refers to OpenCV, and we will also be using NumPy to process the image array, the images, the image arrays, and Matplotlib to visualize the images. So to read images into OpenCV, uh, you use the cv.imread function and pass in the image that you want. And if you click print, what it would give you is the, the array that represents the image. So if our image is a black and white image, it would be a two-dimensional two -dimensional array. But if your image is colored, you would have three color channels and hence it would be three-dimensional. So we can then use matplotlib plt.imshow to visualize the image. So you will notice that something looks off in this image. And this is because the original image looks like this, where you can see the sky is blue. But over here, the sky appears to be orange. And the reason for this is because open the image loaded by OpenCV is in blue, green, and red mode, while matplotlib displays it in red, green, blue mode. So to solve this problem, we need to convert from BGR to RGB, which is known as converting between color spaces. So to do this, all you have to do is cv.cvt color, pass in the image and the what you want to convert it from and what you want to convert it to. And now the image looks as per the original image. And you can do the same to convert it to black and white by passing BGR to gray. Now I'll be going through resizing and rescaling frames. So many deep learning models require that our images are of the same input size, but the raw images that we um, collect when we, uh, when we are creating our data set may vary in size. And this is why we need to do resizing and rescaling. And many machine learning models can also train much faster on smaller images because there are fewer pixels to be processed. So if you do image.shape, you can you will see the dimensions of your image. The first one refers to the height, the second refers to the width, and the third refers to the number of color channels. So three over here since it's a colored image. We can resize the image by using cv.resize and enter the, with the final dimension that you want it to be. But as you can see, the image looks distorted as the aspect ratio wasn't maintained. So to solve this, you can define a function that rescales the image to, to the exact same aspect ratio. So what this does is it, um, it scales the width and the height by the exact same uh, scale, and then uh, uses that dimensions to resize it. So then you can see that the, the aspect ratio of the image is maintained. You can also crop the image by choosing a subset of the rows and the columns from the image array. 
Next, we have image blurring and smoothing. So when you blur an image, you remove outlier pixels that may be noise in the image that may cause the image model to learn um, incorrectly. And this is a common operation that you perform before tasks like edge detection. So there are a few different types of blurring, average, median, and bilateral. So how it works is average blurring, um, you specify a kernel area. For, so for example, 35 by 35. So if it's a 35 by 35 square here, what the algorithm does is that it takes the average of all the pixels within this square and replaces the central pixel by that average. So as you can see, the image is blur, but you can see that the edges are not preserved and the edges have been blurred out too. So to improve this, we can instead use median blurring. And what this does is that um, instead of taking the average, it takes the median, uh, the median pixel value within that kernel size. Um, and you can see that here, uh, the edges are a lot less blur, but it's kind of still diluted. So to improve this even further, we have a method called bilateral filtering, which ensures that the edges are sharp like this. So um, how this works is that it compares the difference in pixel intensity within the kernel. So if two pi pixels have only pixels that are of similar intensities will be considered for blurring. So if you're at an edge, you, wouldn't, you can see that the pixel intensity would be very different. So they would not consider it for blurring. So this would ensure that their edges do not get blurred and hence will remain sharp here. And there are a few parameters here that you can play around with and you can find out more um, from the OpenCV documentation. Next, we have image transformation. And this is used as this is done as part of data augmentation, which is which is a technique that's used to increase the amount of data in our data set by adding slightly modified copies of already existing data. And this, this is very useful when your data set is small to begin with, or if most of the images in your data set are of a similar type. So to get more data, we would just need to make minor alterations to our existing data set and minor changes like flipping, translating our rotation will allow us to increase the quantity and variety of our data set. So for example, you would want this dog and an upside down dog to both be classified as a dog. So um, regardless of the orientation, and this is why you need to show the model different orientations of the same image. So for flipping, you can do it by using cv.flip and passing in a number here that represents the orientation of the flip. So number one would flip it horizontally across the x-axis, zero would flip it vertically across the y-axis, and minus one would flip it both vertically and horizontally. We can also translate our image by defining a translation matrix, uh, defining a function that will wrap a translation matrix around our, our image. And you can also do rotation in a similar way. So you can see that over here, the image has been rotated around the central, uh, around the center. And you can instead also rotate it around a specific pivot by specifying a pivot coordinate. But uh, take note that the rotation function and the translation functions are functions that we have defined and are not given by OpenCV already. Yeah, next, um, drawing on images. Uh, this is very useful when you're doing object detection and you want to draw a bounding box around the image and have a label. So uh, to draw a line, you, you pass, you do cv.line you pass in the image on which you want the line to be, the starting and ending coordinates of the point, as well as the color and thickness. You can also draw a rectangle in a similar way um, by passing in the coordinates of the top left corner and the bottom right corner, and then the color and thickness. And 
Similarly for circle, you can pass in the coordinates of the center and then the radius of the circle. And if you want to color in the, the circle or the square, you can enter thickness as minus one. And finally, you can also add text in a similar way by specifying the coordinates, the font style, the font size, color, and thickness. Now we have bitwise operations, and this will come in handy when we do masking of the images in the next part. So what I'm doing here is to generate the rectangle and the circle that we will be using for to, um, to illustrate the bitwise operation. So to do bitwise, bitwise n gives us the intersecting region between the circle and the square. So all you have to do is bitwise underscore n and you pass in the two images. Bitwise or gives us the union of both images. XOR gives us the non-intersecting regions and bitwise not gives us the complement. So now we have masking. And the purpose of masking would be to create, um, to extract just a specific component of our image. So for example, we want to um, get just this area of the dog that corresponds to the shape of the mask. So what I'm doing here is creating the mask of a random shape. Um, and then using bitwise.end and passing the random shape under the parameter mask. So this will then uh, overlay the mask on the image. Now we have edge detection. And edge detection is used to find boundaries of objects and images, and it's useful for feature extraction and for image segmentation. A, a common, uh, the most uh, popular algorithm used is called the canny edge detector that um, passes the image through a series of steps in the algorithm, which you can read about in more detail from this website. But basically what it does is it converts the image into something like this, where the edges are um, drawn out. So you, you can pass in the image into cv.canny and there are a few parameters that you can play around with that are kind of like a threshold that determines whether or not something is considered an edge. So you can see that over here, when I increase the threshold, there are fewer things that are flagged out as an edge. So this, would, you can like custom make it based on whatever problem you're trying to solve. And previously I had talked about bilateral filtering, which reduces noise in your image. So you can perform, bi perform bilateral filtering first to remove noise and then perform edge, edge detection. So that for example, over here, every, um, every piece of grass won't be detected as an edge. So over here, I'm performing bilateral filtering and then um, putting the image through the edge detection algorithm. And if you compare the original image and the final image, you can see that after bilateral filtering, after having reduced some noise, the edges are a lot better defined. Yeah. Um, next, we have template matching. And template matching is when you have, when you are finding small parts within your image that match a template image. And doing template matching is sometimes a simple, a simple solution for object detection. And it's a lot simpler than uh, building a whole neural network. But this only works if the, object, if the objects you're trying to detect are very similar to the template image. And this might likely come in useful for this data science competition. So over here, I'm reading in the images that we are going to be using, the main image and the template. So we'll be using this image and finding, finding occurrences of this template within this image. So what, this, what we will be doing is to slide, um, to slide this template pixel by pixel across the image. And then for each position of the template on, on the image, there will be a similarity metric that's computed. 
So the result will be a grayscale image where each pixel denotes how much that neighborhood um, matches the template. So the more wide an area, the more similar it is to the template. So you can see here that there's a distinct white um, spot. So this means that the template is most likely to be found in this area. And this uh, dot, the coordinates of this dot refers to the top left, uh, top left corner of the template. So we can get these coordinates by finding the, by passing this through a function called cv.minmax location, which will give us the, and then what we would be interested in is the maximum value, as well as the, the location of the maximum value, which is the top left coordinate of the template. And why this will be useful is when you're drawing the bounding box around the image. So now that we know the top left corner, in order to find the top right corner, in order to draw the rectangle, all we need to do is add the height and add the width to this point to get this point so we can draw this rectangle. Yep. And the maximum uh, value will be important because you might, um, if you have multiple occurrences of a template in your image, you might hope to, you might have a threshold beyond which it's considered that the image is there. And you can create a function that draws many uh, bounding boxes around every occurrence of it, of the template. And finally, we have histogram computation and equalization. So when we, we're gonna compute a histogram that represents the distribution of pixel intensity in the image. So um, by equalizing the histogram, what we will do is to improve the contrast in an image. And this is important because low contrast images degrade the performance of image processing systems because certain details are not very clear. So let's take, for example, this image. You can see that in the bottom half, um, the contrast is quite poor and you can't really see the, the fine details in the image. So we can calculate the distribution of pixels by using cv. Um, Calc hist. Um, and you can see here, and it, it will give you this graph where the x axis refers to the pixel intensity and the y axis refers to the frequency of pixels occurring at this intensity. So you can see that most of the pixels lie within the 50 to 70 range. And um, for the other um, intensities, they are quite underrepresented. So if we now perform histogram equalization, you should see that the range would be broadened. So you can equalize the histogram by doing cv.equalizeHist. And, and you can see that the, the histogram that's returned is a lot more balanced and spread out. And the image that results from this has a much higher contrast. As you can see, you can see a lot more detail in this image compared to the original image before equalization of the histogram. Yep, that's all I have for my part. And now I'll hand over the time to Agatha who will uh, be explaining convol convolutional neural networks. Okay, um, thank you, Rama. So I'll be going through convolutional neural networks. Um, so first, why is CNN? So deep neural networks are powerful function approximators, but due to the employment of so many parameters, deep neural network often is very sensitive to overfitting. Additionally, deep neural networks cannot handle variations such as translations, rotations, and eliminations in images. Therefore, to tackle the, this problem, we developed a deep learning algorithm called convolution, convolution Neural Network, which is also known as CNN. Um, a CNN is able to successfully capture the spatial dependencies in an image through the, Im, through the application of relevant filters. The architecture performs a better fitting to the image data set 
due to the reduction in the number of parameters involved and reusability of weights. Uh, in other words, the network can be trained to understand the sophistication of the image better. What is a CNN? CNN is a very powerful neural network tool. It has a wi very wide range of use, but I believe it is easiest to explain through its application and image recognition. We can, Im we can imagine CNNs as automatic feature extractors from the image. If we use the algorithm with pixel factor, we will lose a lot of spatial interaction between pixels. On the other hand, a CNN effectively uses adjacent pixel information to effectively downsample the image first by convolution and then uses a prediction layer at the end. So if you see a picture here, uh, if you see the picture here, you can, immediately you can immediately recognize what the picture is. That's because the brain recognizes it as a distinct object and immediately classifies it as a dog. So how does our brain recognize the picture above as three dogs in a field? First thing we do is recognize a sharp edge between the green of the background with the brown of the dog's fur. With this, we can recognize a general outline of a dog, which is a long body, not, not so tall, and two ears sticking out. Other shapes inside of this outline have us determine that it is a dog rather than a fox. Consider the tongue, shape of the mouth, nose, and color. So assuming that we want to approach the, uh, the problem of recognizing shape, just like a human does, we may want to start with making an algorithm that will recognize certain shapes or edges in an image, and this is the convolution and pooling in CNN. And so to sum up the structure of a CNN, we first input an image, then perform convolution operation to get an activation map. After that, we apply the pooling layer followed by an activation function, then flatten the last output into one linear factor. The factor is then passed to a fully connected artificial neural network. The fully connected layer will provide a probability for each class that we're after. So yeah, next we'll be looking through the convolution layer and pooling layer of a CNN. So before we get started with the convolutional layer, we need to understand filters first. A filter is a specific shape that we want to extract from the picture, like the one right here. Like you can see right here. Um, let's say we want to detect a curve like this, uh, like the one in the picture. The curve can be represented using a matrix of values, or we can call it a filter. It is also referred to as neuron or kernel, and the depth of the filter is always equal to the depth of the image. So now we want to test if the image contains this shape. So this image right here. If we focus on the section of the image with the same dimensions as the filter, we can calculate a dot product of the image section values and the filter values. So first, let's look into an area of the image that contains the shape we are testing for. The area we focus on is called the receptive field. So it's this one. The dot product for this section computes to 218535 which is a very large number. This number would be less if the shape does not match the filter shape. So here's one of the example where the dot product will be of a lesser value. It's because the shape does not match the shape of the filter. In other words, the greater the result of the dot product is, the more similar the image section and the filter is. Therefore, we can use a dot product of the filter and a section of the image to test where specific shapes are located. Getting the filter values correct is important since you want to test for appropriate shapes. The values that we train in the CNN is the matrix filter, uh, matrix value of the filter. So, okay, so the result of the dot product is then stored in an activation map. Next, we'll be looking through the pooling layer. So the purpose of a pooling layer is to reduce the spatial size of the activation maps. This not only reduces the amount of computation necessary, but also protects against overfitting. The idea of pooling is very simple. We want to reduce large matrices to become smaller ones. The most common pooling technique used is max pooling. The idea of this method is to keep only the maximum value in smaller regions of the activation map and getting rid of the rest. 
In the orange region above, so this one, this orange region above, the maximum value is seven. So it is kept while well, five, three, five, five, three and two are thrown away. Uh, here's the result, like seven is kept. Yeah, this is pooling. Okay, so next we'll be going through visualization of a CNN. Uh, okay, so we can change the input size to simulate the size of an input image. So here, the input is like five, and then the output is five. I'll, uh, I'll also link this link down, down on the YouTube chat so you guys can try it out yourself later. Okay, so yeah, you can see the input size, we can change it. Then kernel size, then we can change the kernel size, which is the filter. If we increase the kernel size to two, the filter will have, we'll have two, times, uh, two times two dimension. So it's the one here. If we increase one more, as we can, as we, oh, sorry, if we increase one more, yeah. So as you can see here, it's going to have a three times three dimension. Now, by increasing the kernel size, the dimension of our output or activation map is reduced. So this is now three times three, while the input is like five times five. To retain the dimensions of the output image, we use padding. So if I increase the padding, Yep, you can see here, like input is like five times five and output is like five times five also. So padding adds zero around the edges of the input. So like make sure the input and output has the same dimension. So lastly, stride. Uh, stride indicates how many pixels the kernel should be shifted over time. Okay. Uh, yeah, so if you see here, if the stride is one, you can move it like five times. Like it only will move one box. But if I increase the stride, it skips two box directly. So this is what it does. Okay. So now we'll be going through uh, the Keras API for, uh, of CNN. It's one of the thing we can use for CNN. So here you can see compile. Compile is to initialize the model. And fit here is to train the models using the input X and then we'll give you out like uh, the output of image Y. Evaluate is to measure how good the model is. And lastly, we have predict. So we use this using the model to predict. Yeah. And for this one, this is the code for convolution. Uh, 32. Uh, so three times three will be here, the kernel size and 32 for filters, and the input shape here, 32, 32, and three. And this is also for the code for pooling. So if you want two times two, you just put here two comma two, yeah. So to summarize what we went through just now, in an image task, we want to do feature extraction before classification. Prior to neural networks, feature extraction was done using classical computer vision, like how my friend Rama just explained. But now we use automatic feature expression via convolutional network neural networks. Automatic feature expression or feature learning is where the convolutional and pooling layers comes in. Afterwards, we feed the extracted result into the neural network to predict the output. So this makes it an end-to-end -to -end -to -end image model. Okay, so this wraps up my part of this CNN. Uh, I've linked also some resources down below like in the in the slides, you, can, you guys can check it out. It's a very uh, good resource to learn CNN if you're just a beginner or like if you want to read up or refresh. Yeah. Uh, let's take a five minute break before we proceed to transfer learning. But, uh, yeah.
Georgie, my friend, will be taking over for the transfer learning part. Thank you. Yeah, we will proceed at 8.35, so take a chill pill. There's only um, one around one hour left. Uh, there is no notebook, notebook for the carers. Um, yeah, that uh, that was just a short introduction to the Keras API. If you have any questions for what has been covered so far, you can feel free to ask on on the YouTube chat first. Okay, someone asked. Uh, what if I have uh, no idea what's going on? How would one start? So I would suggest that uh, you can take a look at Kaggle. Kaggle.com has a lot of um, uh, competitions, past competitions where uh, the community shares uh, code uh, in the form of uh, notebooks, Kaggle notebooks, where you can see their approaches, you can see their code, uh, see what kind of computer vision techniques that they use and how they perhaps form a convolutional neural network specific to that competition task. So uh, many of us uh, start off with uh, Kaggle competitions to learn the practical side of um, uh, uh, doing such deep learning tasks. So Kaggle is one way that you can uh, get started. So you can get started in any approach. Um, so what we just shared is uh, how a convolutional neural network, the idea of it, how it works. Um, we also shared some uh, uh, classical computer vision techniques that you could use for something like data augmentation because um, uh, the data set, the training data set is quite small. So you need to likely need to do some data augmentation to improve the performance of your model. So you can get, you can get started by getting familiar with uh, how uh, to perform data augmentation. You can read up on some deep learning APIs like Kara, TensorFlow, or PyTorch to take a look at how to use uh, their functions for uh, neural network training. Yeah, you can also wait for the second workshop to get started. The second workshop would cover things like um, uh, more related to image task. So for example, how to perform object detection, how to uh, perform object counting. So that will be covered in the second workshop by up level. All right, it's 8.35. Uh, uh, now we'll hand over the time back to Georgie, who will teach us about transfer learning. Thanks, Jet. Okay, uh, it's time for transfer learning. 
But before I talk about transfer learning, let's all imagine that we're in a movie, Alien vs. Predator, and you have built an auto turret with state-of-the-art NVIDIA GPU and camera guarding your base against aliens, also known as xenomorphs. Also assume you're the only survivor in your base and that you need to sometimes leave it to gather resources or you may be asleep. Aliens know that and they may come to attack. Of course, your auto threat can just shoot any damn thing it sees and kill all the alien attackers. However, harmless predators may come by out of curiosity and may even kill the aliens for you. You don't want your auto threat to gun them down as well and make enemies with them. So you can't set it to rampage mode and shoot everything on site. So what can you do? As someone who's into data science, you've probably built an image recognition model for your threat. So it only shoots aliens. But there is a problem. Building such models from scratch requires tons of data. We're talking millions of images per class. So we need millions of images of different xenomorphs and predators to train this model. But clearly, even with the CCTVs around your base, it's not feasible to gather that much data. At most, you'd have a thousand xenomorphs and predators in your data set. So what can you do? Are you going to start war with the predators and make another enemy in the land you're stranded in alone? Fret not. That's where transfer learning comes in. This is when we use another model called the base model as a starting point for training our model. We typically build, uh, pick a base model that has been pre-trained on huge data set similar to the task at hand. For instance, we can use a ResNet 50 base model which has been pre-trained on millions of images of different classes as a starting point to build our alien predator recognition model. ResNet 50 is basically a convolutional neural network that is 50 layers deep with a certain architecture. We wouldn't need as much data to train our model this way as we're essentially transferring the knowledge from a pre-trained one to our task. But before I go into more detail about transfer learning, I think it's apt to talk about feature extraction as it can help us understand why transfer learning works. Feature extraction is essentially the process of extracting quantifiable data from an image unique to the object we want to identify. For instance, to identify a motorcycle, a feature extraction algorithm may extract the two wheels, the fairings, the cowl, the handlebars, and the exhaust pipe. In a machine learning process, when we pass in an image to our feature extraction algorithm to generate a feature vector, a fixed size array of real numbers, we then pass it into something known as a classifier. We pass this vector into a classifier. And a classifier is an algorithm that takes in input data and maps it to a specific output category. For instance, a cat, a dog, or maybe a type of the type of motorcycle you want to classify it as. And how does it know actually what category to map it to? Well, you first have to train it with labeled input data. And labeled means that for each input data, for each x, you know the y, you know the correct output. So training is basically the process of passing in these labeled input data, having the classifier predict the output labels, comparing the predictions of the classifier with the correct output labels that you already know in advance, and updating the classifier weights such that the error or the loss function is minimized through a process known as gradient descent. So just repeat it until you have satisfactory results. You can think of it as doing a ton of practice papers until you're ready to take a real exam, hopefully with minimal mistakes or errors. Generally, we can do feature extraction via statistical methods or deep learning methods. In statistical methods, we employ manual feature extraction using a suitable feature extraction algorithm that is chosen using a domain knowledge for the task at hand. For instance, we can use a corner or edge detection to detect a door on a car. We then will fit the produce feature vector into our classifier to train it as described earlier. On the other hand, in deep learning, our neural network actually automatically extracts features and learns their importance by adjusting the weights of connections between layers of neurons through back propagation. We don't specify any feature extraction algorithm. We just let the neural network decide which features to extract and how to assign importance to each feature to minimize the error or the loss function. So basically, we have an image that passes through layers of our network each layer responsible for a certain operation as Agatha has described. 
before encountering the final layer, which is typically a fully connected classifier layer. Fully connected means that it takes in all the input, all the outputs of the previous layer as input. The output of this classifier is the probability of the image belonging to each class. In this case, there could be a 95% probability that this image is classified as a two and maybe like a 0.51% for the others. But either way, they all have to sum up to 100% or one. Of course, when you train this model, the answer at first could be wrong. Maybe you have a 50% probability that it's two or maybe like 40% and you have like a, uh, maybe like a 50% that is eight. Oh, that's, that's not good, that's wrong. So during training, the answer could be wrong. And this error actually is uh, propagated backwards to previous layers via backpropagation to update the weights and the biases of the connections so as to minimize this error or loss. Now, these weights and biases actually affect which features neural network extracts from the image and the importance to them it assigns. And so that's how it works. A neural network is basically like an end-to-end -end feature extractor and classifier built into one network as compared to uh, the statistical method. And bring your attention back to transfer learning. It's actually a process whereby we leverage on the model already pre-trained on extracting general features and fine tune it to our use case. A model like ResNet50 mobile net or efficient net already pre-trained on huge data set of multiple classes can tell you whether an image is a spoon, a cat or a dog. And this is actually because uh, their weights and biases have already been adjusted to recognize the key features such as maybe eyebrows, the shape, the nose that help discern between these image classes. In general, the earlier layers of a neural network, that is the layers at the left side, they are kind of uh, trained to recognize more general features such as contours, edges, uh, maybe gradients, and deeper layers, the ones to the right, are uh, more uh, trained to recognize more specific features such as how the, uh, from, from the previous layer, such as how the shapes, the gradients, the contours come together to form nose, eyes, and stuff. And even deeper layers take all this information from the previous layer, such as the nose, eyes, and everything, and try to position them and try and form a face. So that's what is meant by uh, recognizing more ge uh, general to less general, or rather less specific to more specific features uh, across the neural network. And in transfer learning, we want to exploit that by taking a pre-trained model and keeping all their weights, which is known as freezing the layer, uh, freezing the network, and reply replacing the classifier layer with our own one, with our own fixed number of classes. Because usually these pre-trained models have a classifier layer with like hundreds of outputs, one for each class, maybe a spoon, dog, cat, fish, mouse, etc. So um, we want to take away the classifier layer and replace it with our own, with our fixed number of outputs, maybe two or three outputs, one for each class. Maybe we just want to discern between a dog and a cat, we will just have two outputs. The probability of each output giving us the probability that the image belongs to a certain class. And so the process of transfer learning is as follows. We take a base pre-trained model, freeze the model, which means we prevent the model weights from being updated during backpropagation in training, and we replace the classifier head with our own. Now, during training, the weights of the connections between the, uh, the layer before the classifier and the classifier, they are updated. So basically this red arrow here, which you can think of as weights, which connect every, uh, uh, think of as the connections that connect every um, output from the previous layer to the classifier, because the classifier layer is essentially a fully connected layer. And so during the training, the weights of this, uh, these connections are updated to minimize the error or loss function, whereas the ones before them are not updated because they are frozen. So then after this, we compile, we train, and then we evaluate the model. And as you probably noticed, there are very few, uh, relatively few connections here compared to the whole network. And therefore, we don't really need much training data to get uh, to reach the uh, optimal. And here is the code taken from the TensorFlow documentation. So over here, we just import the MobileNet v2 model, we initialize it. Uh, we set include top to false, and top, as you think, uh, as you know, it 
means the classifier layer because it's at the top of the network, which is classifier. So we set the whole model to be false, the trainable, trainable to be false. And then we replace the classifier head with our own, with our own number of outputs. Um, this code you can probably find on, or you can find on the TensorFlow documentation. It's very comprehensive there. Uh, so this is just a little short summary, just the gist of it. So this is one way. And sometimes when we do it this way, where we freeze the entire network and we just replace the classifier layer, the uh, results may not be very good. The performance may not be uh, very good. So um, especially if you want to classify things that uh, are not um, maybe you know they maybe they share a lot of similarities with the with the with the data set that our base pre-trained model has been trained on, but there are some specific features that uh, are not accounted for. For instance, in our alien versus predator model, you know the heads of the aliens and the predators they are drastically different from those of humans. Um, not really drastically different, but in terms of like the shape, they are different. But the major facial facial features might be there. So here. There's another way where we do not uh, we, we do not freeze the entire model. We just freeze maybe the first hundred layers and leave the remaining maybe fifty layers unfrozen or twenty layers. And the reason we do this is because, as described earlier, the first um, the, the earlier the earlier layers of the neural network are kind of responsible for discerning these very general features like contours and uh, and nodes and stuff. Whereas the later layers are more for specific features, such as how all of these. Uh, contours, how these nose, eyes, and stuff come together to form uh, more specific features, like a like a face in, in in some sense. So we instead of freezing the whole model, we just freeze the first hundred layers, and we leave the rest trainable. That is, the weights can be updated during back propagation. We also replace the classifier head as described earlier to fit our number of output classes, and then we train it. We train it using uh, our training data set. And all the weights here, which are trainable, which are unfrozen, can be updated to uh, to minimize the loss. Whereas the area, the, the layers which are frozen, they do not get updated. They just stay as they are. So this way, we can really exploit the knowledge of our pre-trained model to suit to 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 to, um, to suit our task. And this is what is known as fine tuning in transfer learning. Here is the accompanying code once again uh, from the TensorFlow documentation. Here we first set the we set the whole model to be trainable, right? And then we freeze the layers, uh, starting from the the, the the leftmost all the way to the rightmost, from starting from the earliest to the uh, later, the most shallow to the deeper layers. So here we just uh, activate through the layer from uh, from the from the zeroth layer all the way to the hundredth one, and we freeze it by setting it to be false, trainable to be false. And once again, freezing it means that we do not let the weights be updated during training, and then we replace the classification hit. And we compile, train, and evaluate. So the process is pretty similar. So finally, relating it to our initial base defense problem, as we don't have to train every single weight of the model from scratch, just the ones between like the final layers that we have unfrozen, we don't really need as much data as before and can probably work with the small data set we have from our CCTVs. And that is how transfer learning saves the day. And this is also a why most people use transfer learning for their problems. It's because uh, transfer learning doesn't require, I guess, as much data as if you were to train the whole model from scratch, because we're essentially training fewer connections. And we're leveraging on the huge amount of information that it already possesses for the general features. And this is uh, why transfer learning is very widely uh, applied in, uh, in, in, in the world. It might come in handy. It might not for your current uh, the chip counting problem. Uh, depending on whether you can find uh, you know, suitable pre-trained model to apply on that chip training problem. But as mentioned by Rama, we probably need a mix of both computer vision and deep learning techniques. And for a more realistic example, uh, relating it to our, uh, sorry, for a more realistic example, you can check out our previous workshop on building an end-to-end -end face mask detector application. Uh, transfer learning was used here to build the model uh, where we fine tune a pre-trained model to detect a mask on the face. We just use something that can detect the faces. We, uh, we, we try to train it. We try to free, we unfold some of the layers and we fine tune it with the uh, face mask data set that we obtain through uh, data augmentation. Yeah. And last but not least, here are some very helpful resources. Uh, first is Andrew Neng, uh, very famous machine learning guy. You can watch his video for more intuition and theory on transfer learning. 
The next one will be the TensorFlow documentation that you will probably have to refer to uh, all the time if you want to code anything in Keras and TensorFlow. Um, the next one is just a Google search for Kaggle. Well, I just put in Kaggle transfer learning there. It has a very helpful notebooks where you can see how other people apply transfer learning techniques to solve uh, Kaggle competitions, which you can probably just uh, copy half of their notebook and solve uh, our competition uh, and maybe just uh, fine tune it and something like that, which is actually what most people do on Kaggle. For the next one, it's a more in-depth understanding on actually how many layers to freeze of the model, of, our, uh, of, of the pre-trained model when you do transfer learning. Do you freeze? Uh, do you freeze like 30% of the layers? Do you freeze 70%? Do you just leave everything frozen? Or what do you do? So this link helps you understand uh, or approximate how many layers to freeze for your use case. The next one would be uh, the Alien versus Predator transfer learning project that I come across online. Uh, I think it's pretty uh, interesting to read. And lastly, it's our face mask workshop that you can take a look. There's also a YouTube video on the link there, which you can watch for uh, deeper insight on how we kind of build it end to end. Because we only we also covered we not only covered like the machine learning how we build the machine learning model, but also uh, the web application itself. And that would do it for my part. Thanks. Yeah, so thank you, Georgie. So hold on, let me try and share my screen. Give me a second. Yes, so. Yeah, so thank you, Georgie. So now that all of you have learned about, you know, classical techniques in computer vision, so an introduction about deep learning based methods and the intuition behind scan architectures, and then finally, an example of how to apply such networks in a more practical setting using transfer learning. I would just like to wrap up this session by recommending a list of more practical tools, frameworks, and resources that you might find useful. And these resources that I introduced will be more specific to building machine learning pipelines and solutions. Right, so first of all, are uh, tools for experiment tracking. So I think as a data science practitioner, you might find yourself conducting a lot of experiments iteratively. And you may even lose track of what you've changed between the experiment as well as the effects of each change, right? And you may wonder how can one actually manage your these experiments in a more organized manner? So, like you know, while you know the folks over at uh, software development have mostly figured this out through building tools that keep a historical log of changes through version control, um, data scientists, I think, for the most part, unfortunately, do not have the same luxury until much recently, where we now have applications such as weights and biases and uh, yeah, Comet ML that uh, do experiment tracking. So these tools allow you to keep track of you know, multiple runs and to lock training curves, um, hyperparameters, uh, evaluation metrics, uh, model weights, nodes, and more. And this is all done just by you know, adding a few lines of code to your code base. And you know, like best of all, like through like most of these frameworks are can be hosted on the cloud, so you can conveniently track experiments even if you're away from the machine, and even collaborate as a team and have all your team members you know contribute to this like same dashboard and log all your experiments to like, the same platform. Okay. Yeah. So now that you have you know the ability to easily keep track of your experiments and hyperparameters. Uh, you may wonder if there actually exists a tool that can help you choose those to choose these hyperparameters automatically. So when I say hyperparameters, I refer to you know the various design choices that you make when building your model pipeline. So for example, uh, this might be the number of layers in your model, uh, the learning rate in your optimizer, or even like the different pre-processing uh, steps that you do to an image before fitting it to your model. And you may sometimes feel that this like hyperparameter choices are arbitrary or that there are way too many knobs to adjust during training. So yes, there are many options for automated hyperparameter tuning. So this includes um, frameworks more specific to Keras like Hyperras and Keras Tuner, and also more generic frameworks like Hyperop and Bayesian optimization that uh, basically employ more sophisticated methods that uh, 
So it performs more extensive experimentation to maximize your objective more intelligently than, let's say, like, you know, brute force hyperparameter search. Yeah, so how do you use such frameworks? So this is actually as easy as, hold on, yeah. Right, so all I have to do is, uh, you first start by defining your hyperparameter search space. So for example, how many, so you want to search, you specify the number of layers to model to be, let's say I want to search between one and three, or you want the dropout rate to be between zero and 0 0.5. So after specifying um, this hyperparameter space, you can just define like a function that takes in these hyperparameters and outputs your model. And yeah. And then after specifying how many trials or how many different hyperparameter choices you like to experiment with uh, that you like to run based on your available computing budget, you can just finally leave it out to the framework to do the rest of the heavy lifting. Right, so you'll find the best uh, hyperparameter setting for you based on your problem task. Yeah, so if you like to go one step further and you know you think that, oh, I'm, I'm too lazy to even attempt to define my hyperparameter search space. Or you think that you know you don't have the domain expertise or any expert knowledge to be able to make an informed choice. Right. Then you can you know you can resort to AutoML. So AutoML, like the name suggests, uh, employs zero something called zero architecture search. So it's an algorithm that uh, yeah helps to find the best architecture for you, basically. And this can be accomplished through packages like AutoKeras or EDANet. And with such frameworks, you only need to specify like the high level architecture of your model. And the framework will like just search for the best, deep, more detailed configuration for you. So for example, this library called EDANet uh, provides a general framework to not only learn a new network architecture, but also to learn an ensemble, right? So a collection, it's a collection of new networks that uh, in which you can combine all your predictive, predictive power to perform better on your pro, on your own problem tasks. So uh, yeah, so just to give you a quick impression of how such algorithms work. So uh, as the following GIF shows, uh, like Ethernet will like adaptive, ad, adaptively grow an ensemble of new networks, and so it, at this iteration, it will uh, measure the loss for each candidate and select the best one to move on to the next iteration. Yeah. So I personally haven't tried out this method before, but so I can't really vouch for them, but I think it'll be uh, interesting to give it a try. Right. right, so next is where to find model. So Georgie introduced the concept of transfer learning, right? And how you can utilize a pre-trained model, uh, a model where some other guy out there has already trained using a specific and typically large data set and using his own computational resources and then fine tuning that on your own task. And you may wonder how do you actually go about searching for such models? And the answer is that uh, such models are typically open source and are in fact very easily searchable and accessible online. So for example, uh, there's this website called Papers with Code that basically uh, builds up a compilation of all the available papers out there and organizes them by um, the task, the domain task, and also uh the specific task yeah so for example uh within computer vision you have tasks like image classification semantic segmentation object detection etc so let's say you like to find like a model for image classification you can head on to this you click on this and you'll see that uh people's code has organized uh all the models by benchmarks so it's organized by um, a data set. So let's say you're interested in a model that can do well on this image that data set. You can uh, click on this and it will not only, so what you see here is a leaderboard of all the models that have been evaluated on this image that data set and its corresponding evaluation metric. So this can be your starting point to as which to search for a model, similar model for your own task. Right, so like for example, I can just, you know, say I'm interested in this paper, I can click on it, and most of the time, uh, papers of code will link to the 
either the official or unofficial implementations of this paper. So you can just click on it and check it out. So it really is a matter of like, you know, going to these GitHub repos, uh, looking at uh, their readme file and then finding a way to understand the API and to integrate them into your own code base. Yeah. And you can also find a uh, list of other models out there through these links. Yeah, so it's not, yeah. All right, so next, uh, next important thing that I like to talk about is where to find data sets. So for machine learning, uh, there's label data sets are the few for your model, right? You know, in most cases, if you have a large enough and suitable training data set for your task, you can easily leave the rest of the heavy lifting to your powerful machine learning model to learn how to do your prediction tasks. So as to where to find publicly available labeled data sets, there's actually many you know, comprehensive data set indexes out there. So for example, you can just head on to uh, this search engine, data set search engine by Google, and you know, search for uh, your desired data set. So for example, I want uh, label, label data set of fashion images. I'll do a fashion uh, classification task. You can just search and you know browse through this list. And then more specific to computer vision, there are also uh, specialized websites like Visual Data, Bifrost, uh, yeah, they have it. That, so it com they compile uh, data sets produced by you know, researchers or by other people. And they have to organize it by you know, the task and also by what images do these data sets contain. So again, if I, if I like to search for fashion images, I can just search for fashion and take a look at this list. And you know, uh, yeah, so I'm interested in image classification, right? So I might check out the data set like this. Okay. Yeah, so other than uh, this publicly available data sets out there, you might also want to create on data sets, you know, so DIY. And I've just listed some links over here they can check out. So for example, you can easily download the assets of Google Image Search through like this plugin. There's a command line interface if you want to do that. And there are also other like graphical interfaces in which you can do the same thing, right? You know, scrape images off the internet. So alternatively, you can, if you're more programmatically inclined, you can use something like more like heavyweight library like Scrapey to do your own like specialized scraping tasks. Okay. Yeah. So lastly, uh, if you like to keep up with table art or cutting edge methods, you can check out these few resources. So realistically, you don't really have to keep up with uh, state of the art or or religiously, you know, unless you're a researcher working in a specific field, or if you're really like trying to squeeze out a few extra points out of a Kaggle completion. But in the case that you like to do so. Uh, so again, papers with code is a good way to keep up with state of the art as uh, like I've shown it maintains this like leaderboard for various data set benchmarks. And like, as you can see over the, this graph over here, it tracks the advancements and the evaluation metrics over the course of different papers. And you can also check out the search engine for academic publications like Semantic Scholar. So, you know, look for citations or references of a specific paper. So for example, I'm interested in this paper called uh, Differential Learning for Image Recognition. I can check out the references. Uh, yeah, in order to find out, you know, what works came before. Or I can also check out the citations to uh, you know, find out what works have built upon this specific technique in order to achieve better results. Yeah, and alternatively, there's also this website called Connected Papers where you can specify a paper and you will use some algorithm to build up this like graph of rated papers where you can then like, you know, explore it like interactively through this graphical interface. So this is another cool resource you can check out. Okay. So yeah, that 
will be the end of our workshop. So just like as a brief recap, we, you know, we went through classical techniques and computer vision to introduction about deep learning based methods and intuition behind TNNs and you, why you might use such architectures for images. And finally, an example of how to apply such networks in the practical setting using transfer learning. Okay. Yeah, so these are uh, some of the references we use in our when building our slides that you can encourage you all to check out. Okay. Yeah. So before we end this session, just something I'll point out is uh, so the purpose of the workshop is just to provide a general overview of computer vision. And the methods that we introduce or talked about may not may or may not necessarily be suitable for this competition. So there's probably a host of other different ways, you know, not necessarily like learning based methods to approach this problem. And I think it's up to you as participants to come up with your own creative ideas. And my general advice would be to focus more on constructing a robust solution to this problem task. So yeah, I just hope you have fun and learn a lot through this competition. All right, thanks a lot, Ita, Georgie, Rama, and Agatha. Uh, so just a heads up again, uh, there is another DSC workshop by UpLevel using computer vision for object detection and counting. And this will be uh, specific for uh, the, the tasks related to the competition that we have. So do note that the workshop will be on 18 January, 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. You can learn more about UpLevel on the link below here. I'd like to uh, give a shout out to the next few workshops that NUS Statistics Society also have planned for semester two, which is the Effective Data Storytelling Workshop on Wednesday, 27 Jan, uh, 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m., as well as Using Tidyverse in R for Data Analysis and Visualization by Sunraj and Tianhui from Statistics Society. To learn more, do take a look at our Statistics Society website down below. Now, thank you very much for joining us in this workshop. And we hope that uh, you have enjoyed yourself. You have learned a lot from this workshop. And do fill in the feedback form for us so that uh, we can be prepared for uh, our subsequent workshops. Thank you very much. These are our contact. And we will stay in the chat if you have any questions. Hello. All right. Yeah. Uh, the workshops will be uploaded. The videos will be saved, and uh, all the workshop resources will be available at the Statistics Society website. You can see over here. So you just click this link, and then go and click workshops, and then uh, there should be a list of all the uh, resources down below.
Yeah, if you have any last questions, just uh, put them in the YouTube chat here. Otherwise, we will close at about 9, 12 p.m. All right, once again, uh, thank you so much for joining our workshop. And uh, thanks again to the presenters, Ita, Rama, Georgie, Agatha, who have been working hard to deliver this workshop to you as best as they can. I'm sure they were super nervous about presenting. So do shout out your appreciation for them in the chat if you can. Um, yep, once again, we'll appreciate your feedback on our workshop so we know how you feel about our workshop. We treat the feedback very seriously and aim to improve on all our future workshops to bring you a great experience in our workshops. So our social links are available below. So uh, do check out especially the Telegram channel where we post about some articles uh, sometimes. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much and all the best participants uh, for the competition.